such an ecosystem. And uh, also uh, in application software, we not only en uh, emphasize the software itself, but also the tools, the, the environment supporting the software development. So we, we are supporting a project working on the parallel program framework, which will ease the job of develop uh, access scale software. And also some uh, project uh, money put onto a national software development center, which will uh, work on the tools work on the software uh, repository and also uh, some uh, product like uh, uh, software systems. So that's uh, the current uh, situation in China. We hope that uh, we can you know, work on some uh, topics jointly with uh, international partners. Thank you. Alison, the situation for uh, I would say for high performance computing and science is very clearly depicted. What about industry? So how do you feel it at the Hartree uh, Center? Right. Okay, um, so the Hartree Center is a relatively new center in the UK. Um, the UK currently has two large high performance compute computers. So one of them primarily for academia and one of them primarily for industry. And that's the one which is hosted at my center. Um, so I'll, I'll explain how this links to Exascale and, and where we're going. So one of the views of, of the UK government, in common I think probably um, with many other governments, is that in order, they don't just want to invest in science, it's important to invest in systems and computers and technology that will have benefits for industry. Um, so our, our mission is to, to try and bring the benefits of high performance computing high performance data analytics and cognitive computing to UK industry to help to make them more competitive. So in particular, the sorts of companies that we're currently targeting will be the large blue chip companies who have substantial research and development um, capabilities in the UK. So, so part of the idea there is if we can work with them, it makes it more likely that they will increase the research and development opportunities and facilities inside Europe and that we will retain and build on the skills and the knowledge that we have there. So our, our new computer, um, which is just about to come into service, will be about around three and a half petaflops. So that's a fairly substantial computer in European terms. And I think it's the largest one dedicated to working with industry, probably anywhere in the world. So as I say, although working with industry helping them to write codes, um, working with them to see how they can use these computers, bringing, looking at things like machine learning, how we can use that to Im improve productivity is very, very important. And the key part of what we do, the other side of our activities is we host a very large range of novel technology systems. So that may seem contradictory, but what industry, one of the things we've discovered is what in most industry has access to a medium-sized cluster for their day-to-day -day work. So they're looking for two things from a center like us. They're looking for access to a much bigger computer so that they can run some of their newer models and, and do the development for the future. But they're also slightly bewildered by the huge range of new architectures and new technologies that are coming out there. So they want access um, to, to a center which understands these technologies and can help, can work with them to try and see how they should be taking their development and how they can take advantage of these technologies going forward. So there are a few areas where we see that um, exascale will be important to industry. For example, things like whole engine modeling for jet engines at the moment, that's just too complex to be done even on the biggest supercomputers we have. Um, but if they could model the whole engine, then we could have much more efficient engines, um, you know, uh, reduce um, costs, uh, make them safer. So that's, that's one immediate objective. Another area where we see um, <coughs> companies would, would like to, to go in the future is digital twinning. So through, through the data that you get back from building something like a power station or a very large ship or an airplane, if you can collect in all that data, while it's running and build a digital twin, then you're able to predict any failures, um, to 
is it take, take evasive action really quickly. You can see that happening with uh, production systems as well. So, so there's a real interest in, in where the technology is taking us and how that can be applied directly to industry. So our job is, is to kind of sit between industry and academia, look at what's being done in terms of developing new technology, and to look at, at the opportunities for industry and, and how we can bring these two together. So, so one of the things that we'll be doing is uh, we're a partner in the EuroExa project, which is one of the new projects which has come out of all the future and emerging technology building blocks that have been done in Europe. Um, we are going to be hosting the prototype machine at the Hartree Center and working very closely um, with, uh, with the other academic partners, so that, and we'll also be providing an industry input into that. So I think the, the final thing I wanted to say is I, I think there's also a role it's go, um, going forward. If Europe is to develop exascale capacity, I think supporting and discovering some smaller technology companies and integrating them into the ecosystem is going to be important. So I think the larger technology development centers that we have in Europe are a magnet for smaller companies. I think they, they'll attract, they, they attract data centric companies, even if they can't immediately see how they're going to use the exascale technology and some of the new developments. I think technology companies tend to come together and it's by working with them or, or having them all in the vicinity that we'll discover some of the stars of the future and work out how we can, we can integrate them. Very clear, thank you. Per, how do you see it from uh, the point of view of a member state that uh, is fully involved and integrated in the European approach and European, I would say, efforts in terms of high performance computing? So, uh, and uh, wha wha how, how things are developing also in your country from mm -hmm. that aspect? Yeah, let me comment on that. Um, yeah, so Sweden is, uh, although it's a small member state, it uh, has a pretty vital industry. and. Uh, High performance computing is, of course, very important, uh, um, of course, for uh, science advances, but also for the industry. I mean, we have uh, a viable um, uh, automotive industry, uh, of course, Ericsson in, in the telecom area. And these companies, of course, uh, uh, it's uh, vital to them to uh, have access to high performance computing technologies. Uh, but I, I would also like to give the perspective, of course, from my uh, field of expertise in computer architecture. Uh, in fact, so 30 years ago, I was a PhD student, and the topic I worked on was uh, memory systems for uh, multiprocessors. And uh, now, 30 years later, it's still something that, that uh, challenged me and, and I guess, uh, the field a lot. Um, uh, really, uh, I mean, uh, so what has been mentioned is, of course, the big challenges for high performance computing is to uh, get get all the get get the high performance out of the codes and with the, you know uh, limited efforts on the software side, and there are lots of challenges and they all, many of them are rooted in, in the in the systems themselves and in the memory system. For example, doing a memory access is uh, two orders of magnitude more energy consuming than doing a computation. Uh, so there is a, a big, big room for I improvement. Um, uh, Professor Jellick uh, mentioned, uh, you know, um, it's uh, uh, it's the end of, of the era of, what did you say, re uh, uh, ha having uh, performance-oriented programmers uh, sitting down and relaxing. I would say it's the end of, end of the era of ha having computer architects actually <laughs> relaxing. Um, in fact, in the uh, late 90s, uh, uh, I got a little bit bored about computer architecture because Moore's law was just doing too well, so it was so easy to, to make advances. But uh, so it's more fun today to actually be a, a computer architecture researcher. Uh, a few comments about the end of Moore's law. Um, uh, so 2021 sounds really alarming. Now I, I don't think it's gonna you know, co come to complete stop that very, very uh, soon. Uh, there are lo lots of uh, tricks, a lot of innovative uh, things that can be uh, played yet, probably s another 10 years or so. But having said that, I think it's really time to start, uh, 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 you know, starting uh, uh, very important projects in computer architecture to 
to um, make up for that. And, and uh, I would not limit myself to, you know, incrementally try to, you know, make CMOS uh, 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 being alive, but, but really looking into new approaches. Um, uh, quantum computing has been mentioned. Um, I'm, I find it interesting. I don't think it will happen very soon. And by all means, I don't think it's going to be a, a panacea. It's not going to be a general, it's not general purpose kind of thing. It's an accelerator. Mm. Talking about accelerators, really what happened 10 years ago with multi-core shift, we were forced into that shift. It was of, of uh, end of general scaling, things like that. And now uh, what also Professor Yelik pointed out with accelerators, we we're going to see more specialized architecture. All these things, m the multi-core shift and the accelerator shift, is like a huge challenge, of course, for the software, right? So that's um, a final note I would like to make is that uh, I'm the coordinator of the Eurolab for HPC um, uh, project. Um, and uh, one uh, thing we have done in that project is actually to come up with a long-term uh, research vision, you could say, for a system, computer, or computer system research it actually looks at all across the layers for HPC system technology beyond the exascale era. So that's ready. I think it was distributed in the bag. So, um, so I'm here just to try to mark it, you know, <laughs> have a look at that. Okay. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, I, I uh, would continue directly to one from what you said. I mean, uh, uh, what's the future of uh, high performance computing architecture? So, uh, so, the so I mean, Cathy, I think, has very well depicted the, uh, the picture with regards to exascale and what we're expecting from the exascale in terms of scientific applications. And ba basically, I think it's, it, it's very clear what exascale would bring to science, would bring to all these challenging scientific applications we have. I think she depicted a little bit also the picture, as you just mentioned, in terms of uh, new computing architectures, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the end of Moore's law, I've been hearing about that since the 80s or the 90s. Now we are, we are for the first time maybe in history approaching this end. So this generates huge challenges, as you highlighted all, in terms of uh, new architectures that we need. Is it parallel architectures, specialized architectures? I don't know. Uh, and of course, we all start investing massively on quantum. Now, to my knowledge, there will be no quantum uh, computer, at least with sufficient number of qubits, because we still have uh, a huge challenge there. Maybe we have now 10, 15 qubits computers, uh, but even there, we are facing huge challenges. We'll not be able to uh, come with something relevant, basically before the end of the uh, 2020s. So how, from your perspective, exascale is almost there. I mean, we are all working on to that, but what is next? I mean, how do you see this transition? Where should we work? Apart from what has been mentioned so far, how do you see the transition to the quantum? Is quantum going to completely, you know, out, uh, uh, outperform all the existing systems we have, or should we prepare this transition? Would there be a sort of hybridification of bet between what we have in terms of advanced computing architectures and, and quantum? So how are, do you see that picture coming, let's say, in the next six, seven years after the end of the Moore's law? Matteo or whoever else would like to, uh, to take the floor. Okay. You mentioned many, many things, okay? So yes. as I say at the beginning, uh, to reduce power, you need to go to accelerator, but there are different kind of accelerator you can build since a specific application processor as the Anton processor, as the Anton uh, computer, and you can get 100 or more deficiencies, or you can go improving the numerical, artificial intelligence for vector, graphs, neuromorphics, computer, analog computing. So we are going to a world where we are going to have many, many different kind of accelerators. I would like to comment what Paul say about the co-design, okay, later. So the problem will be how we are going, how the software is going to deal with this different accelerator. Are we going to complicate for the reason I say that the real victims of the exascale will be the programmers. They will suffer a lot, okay? And just uh, comments about the quantum computing, and my opinion, until two or three years ago, just the way was doing small things. 
But now, when the big companies invest a lot of money, it means that there are some, a lot of money to win, to get, okay? So now we had the huge companies, uh, uh, IBM, Google, Microsoft, investing a lot of money. Why? Because they know that we have some, a few problems that using a quantum computer can be solved in a very reasonable way, and using the classical supercomputing probably never. Factorization, I can mention some kind of, uh, uh, a few problems, that if you get a solution, you will get uh, a lot of money, okay? So now, uh, there are many quantum computers, different technologies, you can, there is a balance between the number of qubits and the stability of this qubit, what is good is that there, are, there is a very good relationship between the classical architecture and the, and the, and the quantum computers. Okay? As per se, the quantum computers will solve a few applications and will be connected to a classical computer. And there are now compilers, there are simulators, there are compilers that generate it a little bit instruction for the uh, normal classical computer, for the, for the supercomputer. So I would say in a few years we are going to have a kind of accelerator for a specific application using hybrid and part of them quantum computing. In this direction, I think it's very good the idea you have in the European Commission to uh, potentiate also this field with the flagship. I think it's a very good idea. Other interventions, Satoshi? So firstly about quantum computers, you know, quantum computers, there are two types, there is a quantum gate logic and there is a quantum annealing machine. Very, very different. Uh, although there are some, apparently there's some theoretical results that say it's somewhat related, but basically they're different. Um, quantum annealing machine was invented at Tokyo Tech, by the way, uh, by Professor Nishimori, so I'm very proud of that. However, I'm very negative about that. <laughs> uh, because basically it's a common, uh, because it does uh, annealing in a very, uh, in a very, I would say, in a very efficient way. But, you know, what, what could it be used for? Well, mostly, you know, there are lots of uh, heuristics that are very well tailored for classical optimizations that the applied mathematicians have worked on for uh, operate research people have worked for so long, long time. It's very difficult to beat these, uh, uh, for the quantum annealing machine to beat these, the, these uh, classically optimized algorithms. Um, the hope is that uh, because of the uh, stochastic sampling, um, characteristics of the quantum annealing machine that we can, that may be used to optimize some of the slower algorithms like uh, SGD and, um, um, and deep, deep neural networks to find some, you know, some, some plateau um, where, you know, it's difficult to search, it's very slow to search by these types of uh, classical algorithms, but, um, but you know, you, uh, but then it comes to question, do you really need that? Because, um, you know, what you're trying to look for in deep neural networks is a fairly robust solution where, you know, uh, when you have a sol multi-dimensional solution space, you're looking for fairly flat, fairly flat um, bottom surfaces. But, but, but if you find, uh, if the quantum computer finds some real sharp valleys, it's not a very useful solution. So, um, I mean, there are some, you know, theoretical results that say otherwise, but uh, largely I don't think quantum annealing machines are really useful in that regard. Uh, quantum gate logic, yes, um, it's useful. Of, uh, there are like 50 different quantum algorithms. Um, by the way, quantum algorithms give you polynomial time solutions to uh, otherwise empty hard exponential uh, problems. So it's still polynomial. So you need lots of qubits to solve some of the problems. And, uh, but the two principal applications that have been identified are basically factorization, which leads to cryptography, and one is uh, quantum simulation. I, I know of no other applications that are, can be sped up by quantum computers effectively. Maybe there will be some others, but like PEEs, et cetera. There are people looking for some specific catalyzer. What? That catalyzer. If yeah, yes, yes, they yes, get, yes, they get they, very specific, yeah, I'm, I'm they get the solution, oh, yes. they will change the no, way. No, I'm going to say that. So, so quantum simulation, and like, like uh, Mateo said, quantum simulation for for building fertilizers, uh, replace, somehow replace Haber-Bosch uh, process, for example, that's been touted by Microsoft. Those are, those themselves are very valuable for society because you know, Haber-Bosch uses a tremendous amount of energy in society, um, you know, to just build fertilizers for food, but food is important. Um, but again, those are really the two, the quantum simulation 
which may lead to new drugs, new fertilizers, very important. Cryptography, yes, very important. But it doesn't solve PDs. Okay, so um, that's one. So what else? So we really need something, you know, we really need to accelerate uh, conventional computing because otherwise we won't solve real pro uh, many multitudes of major problems in this post war era. So what do we look for? Well, so one thing, uh, what we're missing, I believe, as what uh, Kerr actually mentioned, is, um, is bandwidth, is memory in the system. Like I said, why is K computer, the K computer still effectively the number one machine in the world after seven years? Because it has tremendous bandwidth. Now, Kathy mentioned that uh, you know, the moving movement of data is very expensive. Now, it, but, but it's expensive because our architecture is not good. Our memory architecture is not, is not very good. So there will be a significant, uh, uh, I believe that there will be significant uh, technological advances made at the, both at the device level, at the manufacturing level, and also at the you know, software and other levels where exploitation and uh, increasing uh, of these uh, bandwidth in the system uh, movement of data become increasingly smaller as we go to newer generations of hardware. For example, we can have microvias, and uh, we can, you know, we can increase the via density. We can continue to increase the via density much, much, much greater, uh, multi uh, at a greater rate compared to what we have in lithography. So we have right now our via bumps are big. Can we can make it really, really small? If we can make it really small, that's much, much bigger multitudes than what we can do with achieving lithography. So, so as I believe bandwidth, uh, memory, bandwidth, uh, reducing the power in, in terms of data movement will be the key to the next generation uh, of uh, technologies in post-war. So, of course, that has its limits, but, um, but uh, it has, um, but remember that Moore's law is a, more, is a law about parameters. Okay, Param parameter uh, lithography basically relative, uh, dictating performance and this lithography improving over time. So many of the solutions that's been mentioned, it's a one-time stopgap solution, and that doesn't solve the Moore's Law problem. What solves the problem is continued improvement of certain technology over time. And uh, what imp will improve over time is spatial, something that's, that's uh, usually spatial. And that involves, again, reducing the energy of data movement, and then that involves compacting the space for data movement over time. So that's gonna be the solution. So uh, I said that the uh, current status is that there is no uh, disruptive technology uh, at this time. So uh, I predict that uh, in the near future, there will be two directions in, uh, towards the next generation computer. One is the more uh, the highly uh, uh, heterogeneity uh, within the chip. Because we emphasize the application-aware architecture or application-oriented architecture. That means there is no one architecture supporting uh, multiple applications. So we need to uh, put more uh, accelerator or special purpose unit into the chip. And also those uh, accelerators can be used on demand. That means uh, we need the dynamic reconfigurable uh, chips so that uh, the, the dark silicon uh, problem can be a kind of uh, advantage uh, in uh, improving the chip pr uh, performance. And another uh, approach is to using the streaming style architecture or programming because of the uh, memory wall or the uh, power consumption issues. For the streaming style, that means uh, data will move through the hardware and the software processing and, and then we get the result from the other side. So that means uh, we, we avoid the, the store and the load uh, operations to reduce power consumptions. So I think those two directions might improve the current uh, architecture and uh, especially for the uh, energy efficiencies. For the uh, quantum computer, I'm a little bit conservative because you know in China there is some uh, advertisements that uh, if uh, we have already uh, uh, approaching the quantum computer, which will be millions times faster than the Tianhe, uh, the, the, than the Sunway Typhoon Light. So it, it's kind of, you know, uh, I, I, don't, I don't say it's a commercial one, but some uh, scientific, uh, you know, slogan is also like that. But I think uh, in the near uh, future, for example, in 15 years, 
we don't have, we don't, we, we cannot see the general purpose quantum computers. Sure, Alice. I'm not a computer architect, um, so I have a slightly different view, which I, I think is there are obviously, at least it seems to me, there are so many different technology choices now that it's probably a great time to be involved in computer science, but we have to ensure that with the limited money and the limited time that we have at our disposal, we, we spend some time thinking about what are the problems we're trying to solve, what, what's the end user requirements, and direct, first of all, direct what we're doing towards solving particular problems. I mean, quite often vendors will phone me up and they'll say, you know, Alison, um, if we gave you such and such an example of this new architecture, can you tell me some big industry companies that would like to use it? And the answer is no. You know, you have to, to find, I can't just say, oh, go to X or Y because they're bound to want to use neuromorphic chips or whatever. You have to work with them, you have to define the problems, and you, you have to look for the solution. So it's not as simple as saying, here's some new technology, it's really exciting, we spent a lot of time developing it, let's try and find someone who would like to use it. I think we have to be smarter and more focused. Okay. Um, yeah, it seems like we are moving into an era of a special, from general, I say, general uh, platforms to specialized, but uh, I, I have a huge problems with that. I mean, if we look at the Google uh, Tensor Processing chip, that makes a lot of sense, obviously. I mean, they are attacking a, a really big problem when it comes to uh, using machine learning techniques for searching, so that makes a lot of sense. But really, the big question is, uh, sh sh I mean, how do we, what should we accelerate in the future? And finding those accelerators that Solve, solve a, a, a problem for a, a significant uh, uh, wide variety of computational problems. That, that is, seems to me a very big challenge. Um, on the other hand, when it comes down to the TPU chip, it's actually doing a lot of ma matrix-oriented operations. So maybe that's more general. But uh, the big question for me is actually, I mean, how specialized should the accelerators be? Can we find kind of more, you know, a little bit general purpose kind of accelerators. That's, that's an interesting direction as I see it. Very good. Cathy, would you like to? Yeah, I just, um, I think the one thing that hasn't been mentioned is um, I think there's a possible trend toward more open architecture design. So in the same sense that open software became a you know, really important part of the whole computing ecosystem, I think that um, there's a possibility that, and perhaps combined with smaller chips that, that the, you know, the, some people call them the chiplets and things like that, that you actually can let um, groups of people design their own chips. And they're, they're, we're seeing you know, trends like there's a um, Sci-5, the RISC, RISC-5 processor architecture, which is an open ISA. And um, so I don't know whether it's gonna take off, but I think that that's something that, that may also, would have a dramatic effect on how these systems get designed. It might allow us to design things that are, are architected for PDEs or whatever it is that we, that we really care about. And the only other comment I was just gonna make on quantum is I would probably separate simulation, the kind of circuit-based and um, annealing and just, I, I do see in the next, I, I would say even five years that we're gonna see some impacts from quantum simulation for a narrow set of problems such as materials and chemistry modeling. Yes, I would like to comment. Uh, concerning to the last comment from uh, Cathy, I was mentioned ReFi as one of the main topics that we are going to deal in the European Initiative, okay? By the way, uh, I am not nationalist, but the Linux was originated in Europe, and the ReFi from one European person, but we need to go, okay. So I will take the word from Per. I agree with you. You know, we have been in many computer architecture uh, conference, and people, very high people say, computer architecture is dead. I never agree on that. <laughs> I never agree on that. What happened is that when I was doing research in superscalar processor many, many years ago, it was not any collaboration between the hardware and the software. Just in very long stretch on war and in vector because you need the compiler, okay? Now, the key, uh, techniques to advance is, as uh, Paul said, the co-design. So what we did in Barcelona starting many years ago, as I would say, is to give the power to the runtime. 
you have many applications, you have a given hardware, so the runtime is the responsible even for reduced data movement, even to, to see how uh, we move data from one memory to another one. So one step further, we say the 